DC. She thanked her supporters both inside Burma and across the world and called for peaceful dialogue with the military junta. She said she wanted to remove the sources of disagreement with the ruling generals. Our World Affairs editor, John Simpson, secured the interview. He started by asking her if she wanted a velvet revolution like the one in the former Czechoslovakia in 1989. I know it's the most turgid and obvious of questions, and it have been asked in any way several times in the last few hours, but how does it feel? How does it really feel inside you? that you don't have to be restricted to a set of walls, that you can go out and see people, your own people. I've said this before, and I don't know if people really believe me, but it's the absolute truth. I've always felt free. Uh, being shut up in the house didn't make me feel very restricted. I had my books. I was very lucky, after all. It's not like being in prison. You're in your own house. You can read. You can listen to the BBC and uh, you can listen to music and you have things to do in the house, keeps you occupied. So I n never felt I was not free. I suppose you could say that I depended a lot on inner resources. And uh, the main difference now is that I don't seem to have time to breathe now. <laughs> Everything's happening so quickly and so much is happening all the time. And so many people want to see you and, and shake your hand, touch you must be also a little bit alarming sometimes, isn't it? The crowds pushing each other. No, not alarming. It's very touching. Because I, I spoke to somebody from the BBC about it last night. That a lot of the people who come to greet me and who come to just wish me well, a lot of them are obviously not very well off. And you can see that they have to lead very tough lives. Yet in spite of all their hardships, the, the happiness for me, the happiness uh, because I'm free, it's, it's very touching. It's, uh, it makes you understand what humility really is. So now it's, it's finished and you can look back on it. Uh, the whole experience, the seven years and then all the years uh, before then, it's taken a terrible toll of your personal life, hasn't it? A terrible toll in many, many, many respects. Your sons not being able to be with your, with your husband. Hard time. I don't feel that I've... So many others who have... I, I don't think I've suffered greatly, of course. But that uh, that is... I wouldn't call that a suffering. I think that is just something that happens if you're fond of people and you're not allowed to be with them. But it must have been a very difficult decision not to leave the country, to go with your husband, to go and see your husband when he was dying. Yes, that is a difficult decision, but he knew that that was the decision I would make and he was fully supportive up to the last moment. And you've spoken to your younger son, Kim, haven't you? I've been? spoken to both of them. Oh, uh, yes. uh, uh, by phone, presumably? Yes. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, I mean, mobile phones have really taken off everywhere yes. while you've been in prison. What did you think when you saw this little thing to speak on? I was a little surprised. I mean, it started at my, at my gate, all these mobile phones, people uh, holding them up to take photographs and so on. I was surprised that there were so many of them. And when I spoke to my son um, in Bangkok, it was the first time I'd ever handled one and I didn't you really... Had never had a mobile phone? No, no, no I, I'd seen people, when I say people, I mean the, the, my security officers using mobile phones, but I'd never handled one before. Of course, I've seen them in photographs in the news magazines, but um, I, it felt very inadequate to me. It, it was so small and there's no mouthpiece. And I didn't know whether to keep it near my mouth or near my ears, or you just keep shifting it around. And, and everybody kept assuring me, go on, it's all right, you can, you can say what you want, and he'll hear you perfectly well. But you knew that you could take a photograph with one. Well, oh, I know that. I, so I, when everybody was holding them yes, up, Yes, I, I knew, knew what they what were doing, for, but I was yes. a little surprised because so many of them were doing it. I mean, it, it, there's been an explosion, of course, of yeah. phone ownership in Burma. Uh, Everywhere, I believe. Yes. 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 Can I ask you a, a fairly crude question, a sort of basic question? 
which might get you into trouble uh, if I ask, but do you want to see the military government fall? I don't want them to fall. I don't want to see the military falling. I want to see the mili military rising to dignified heights of professionalism and true patriotism. And do what? And do what is best for the country and what the people want. I think it's quite obvious what the people want. The people just want better lives based on security and on freedom. I've, I've spoken to a lot of people and I, I usually ask them, what is it you want most? And some of them say, um, I want to be free. Some, some say I want some sense of security, financial security as well as personal security. So that's what it all comes down to in the end, two things, freedom and security. And this is what needs to be balanced finally in any, any society. And I, th I think too often the authorities in Burma uh, keep using security as an excuse for depriving the people of the basic freedoms to which they should be entitled. But these changes couldn't come while the military government's in power, could they? I would like the military government to take the initiative. I would like them to be the people who have decided that our country has a right to certain standards of freedom, to certain standards of security. Well, I want them to be the heroes. Why not? It would give them a sense of confidence. It would heal the wounds of the nation. And I think we'd all get on a lot better if they were the ones who brought true democracy to Burma. But of course, things don't always work out like that. You usually have to work for freedom. It's not simply given to you. In some countries, there have been what people have called velvet revolutions. Is this is Burma the kind of country that might have a velvet revolution or something rather tougher and harder? I have to confess that I don't quite associate velvet with the military, but uh, it would be nice if this kind of thing could happen. And uh, apart from the fact that I think it would be nice, I think we also have to try to make this kind of thing happen. Try and... Try. Well, I don't know whether, as I say, velvet re revolution sounds a, a little strange, but I mean in the context of the military. But uh, um, a non-violent revolution, let's put it, put it that way. So... Because a change, a great change, means a revolution, whether it's violent or non-violent. And we would like a non-violent, peaceful revolution. If I report, as a result of what you've said, that you're looking for a non-violent revolution, will that get you put back in, under house arrest again, do you think? I don't quite know how they would interpret the word revolution. I don't know how you are using the word revolution, but for me, revolution simply means radical change, if you like, uh, or noticeable change. You know, re revolution is something that people do notice. It's, it's not something that, uh, that just goes by quietly. So it will have to be a great change, a great change for the better, brought about through nonviolent means. The first television interview with Burmese pro-democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi was by the BBC's World Affairs editor John Simpson and will have continuing and extensive coverage of the situation in Burma throughout BBC World News.